it really doesn't matter where you're from or what your background is. And, um, and what sort of significance in my case is for um, someone who didn't really um, play with computers as a child or even you know, understand computers uh, when I was growing up. Um, I am now designing some of the most advanced uh, processes in the world. Welcome to Frank Stajano Explains. Today's topic is, what kind of stuff do you get to do after a PhD in computer science? Today, I've invited an old friend who completed his PhD in my department quite a while ago, then got into an extremely prestigious research fellowship at Trinity College, and is now a chip designer at one of the leading microprocessor makers in the world. We continue our series of interviews with interesting Cambridge computer scientists who don't fit the stereotype. And today we hear from Bo about his experience in what is still a white-dominated field. I hope that his story encourages you to take up computer science at university yourself, ideally even at Cambridge and even at Trinity. If you find this video inspiring, give it a like. I really appreciate it and it helps the channel a lot. If you want more videos like this one, subscribe. And if you have any questions, ask us in the comments. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone. I'm very happy today to introduce you to Bo Aiole, whom I've known for a long time because he did his PhD about uh, 15 years ago in the computer lab. Uh, and he was a student at Trinity before I was involved with Trinity. Uh, and after that, he has gone on to a fantastic um, junior research fellowship at Trinity, which is the, you know, the smartest fellows we have in Trinity, the title A's, are the ones who are chosen not because they do work. I mean, I'm a fellow at Trinity because I work for Trinity, but he was a fellow at Trinity just because he was brilliant. And so they said, you're so brilliant that we want you to be a fellow for five years. You have no duties other than being brilliant. Be brilliant for five more years after your PhD. That's what they told you, right? Yeah, that's right. Thank you for the kind words. <laughs> and that, that was a while ago. And since then he's been working in, in industry, but I'll, I'll just shut up. Just, you know, Bo is exceptional, but I'll let him introduce him, himself in his own words. So please say something about you, who you are, uh, why you're here, what makes you tick, and so on. Thank you. Thanks for the kind words. Um, so I'm a principal research engineer at R in Cambridge. Um, I was born in Cameroon and I came to England when I was 17. I'm passionate about making computers run as fast as possible. As it turns out, when um, computers run very fast, they tend to become less efficient. And my job is to rebalance that equation. So how can you make computers that run incredibly fast while remaining as energy efficient as possible? So that's one of the things I'm really passionate about. I'm also interested in future technologies like self-driving cars, intelligence, autonomous systems. And I often joke that I'm working very hard to become lazy. <laughs> And if I'm successful, I will end up with um, machines, which will go on to design other machines, and then I'll just ride off into the sunset. That so sounds that very cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so long as you're still the one getting the salary instead of them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to figure out how to monetize that. <laughs> yeah. yes. You don't want them to, to steal your job, but if you can get the credit for the stuff they do because you invented them, then it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So let, let me dig back because we are, we, are, we are talking to people who are so young that they haven't yet decided what to do at university. And we want to let them figure out that actually computer science would be great for them, like it's been for you and for me. Right. So you said you came to the UK at 17. At that time, did you already know that computing was the coolest thing for you? Um, no, I don't think I did. So um, funnily enough, though I now design processes for a living, I had almost zero experience with computers when I was growing up. Um, and around the age of 16, I wrote a simple program on a calculator, which worked out the roots of a polynomial equation. So it wasn't anything fancy, um, but I just remember that incredible feeling that something that took, what, minutes or, or perhaps sometimes you know hours to work out you know on a piece of with a piece of paper um took just a fraction of a second you know on a computer or on some sort of uh, machine that could do things automatically so I, I was fascinated by computers but i didn't know a great deal about them or um or even how to sort of how do we put together so um talk less of you know 
what what the what the hardware or the internals of the computer look like. A um, couple of years later, I got introduced to C at um, university, and um, that is still my my go to language. So I still enjoy programming in C. Um, obviously, um, in my job, I can always raise or, or lower the level of abstraction as necessary. So where did you go for your undergraduate degree? Because you came to Cambridge for your PhD, right? Where did you do before that? That's right. I went to the University of Liverpool to study um, electrical engineering and electronics. I really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you had already made a choice on the basis of having found it was so cool to find the a root of a polynomial uh, using a calculator. How did you learn that part? Because that's pretty advanced for a 16 year old. I mean, I certainly didn't do that at 16. <laughs> yes, so um, I, th I think the thing that sort of underpins everything is maths. And it's safe to say that getting to grips with the language of mathematics was probably um, a really key stage um, in my progress. Um, I spent more time, more, sorry, more time in those early years studying the sort of mathematical basis of, uh, of various things, uh, physics, uh, chemistry, and so on, and biology. Um, and I didn't write any code then, but when I did start writing code and when I did start programming, that mathematical foundation was very instrumental. And who, so in, in, in your school years, uh, who or what introduced you to uh, this uh, initial programming? stage I'm, I'm trying to get at the initial start. <laughs> uh, yeah i'll say it's probably my lecturers at the university so uh, i i did as an as part of my engineering degree i had to take courses in programming so, so yeah um initially we just you know studied about how electrons moved around <laughs> in wires um but yeah eventually we did you know get around to, to doing some programming we started with c um, later on, I did some Java, and um, I eventually found out that I liked languages that were closer to the machine. So I, I did a lot of assembly programming as well. Uh, you you ended up designing processors. Is this a, an indication that the lower you went and the more enjoyable it was? You wanted to be <laughs> physical and get to yes. the transistor? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's one way to put it. I found it more enjoyable to be, yeah, to be basically in the machine. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think I've always sort of had some attraction to understanding how things work. Um, and even though I said um, I didn't have any sort of experience with computers growing up, I still had, you know, that sort of curiosity about, well, what, what's inside it, what, 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 what makes it tick. And, um, and I, I remember taking various things apart as a child, you know, from, you know, simple things like, you know, radios to more adventurous things like, you know, the, some of the toy cars I had, you know, the, the remote controlled ones. Um, and, and just trying to see how not just the, basically the, the controller worked, but, but how the internals of the, the toy car would work. So what, what, what made the motor turn? Where did the power for the motor come from? How is the battery connected to it? And, um, and you know, and there was a time when I was, you know, so passionate about it, and I kept thinking, well, surely it must work backwards, because you know, the textbooks said you, you know, you could have a motor that also worked as a generator. Um, but obviously, I didn't really know back then that you know, the motors that were in toy cars were in set up that way, <laughs> and you couldn't run them backwards. <laughs> well, I remember when I was a teenager, I was very much into photography, and so I thought, well, when I have you know, I have to decide what to do at university. I'd like to be someone who can design the next camera, for example. So, you know, that's how I went into engineering. Was there something that you wanted to do that took you to become an engineer? Um, well, that's the thing. <laughs> I haven't, I don't think I was really um, passionate about becoming an engineer per se or doing computing as an end in itself. Um, it's always been a means to an end for me. Um, that sort of that fact that you know as I was growing up, I, I was sort of looking around, you know, in my environment, and I dreamt about becoming a scientist and solving some urgent problems, say in healthcare. So I was really back then I was thinking about becoming a medical doctor, some sort of medical professional, you know, perhaps going into medical research. Um, I didn't go end up going into the healthcare sector, but I realized early on that there was this link between being, being able to process information. So finding things out, gathering information. 
and and being able to use that that information to improve society so i could you know see the power of, of information processing um my reasoning was really something like if we can sort of gather that information and build you know some prediction more predictive models say um then we could do that and improve the um society by being able to spot problems before they they occur or um or understand the trends and being able to to sort of tackle them because we can do the sort of the analysis to prepare for tomorrow's problem by doing certain things differently um, today. Um, but back then, I didn't really, like I said, I didn't really understand what the tools were, were like or how, you know, you put the computer together to do sort of this analysis. Um, and if I had sort of seen the scale of achievements that had already happened, you know, in computing or the sort of the enormity of the task ahead, you know, how, you know, computers are made of, you know, so many complex parts, I probably would have been daunted. Um, but I think I was sort of fearless enough and simple minded enough to just sort of dive right in and, um, and start studying engineering. And um, yeah, and eventually I, I started, you know, seeing how you could do something that, you know, I only dreamt of for real, how you can start using computers to, to solve a lot of problems in the world. Hmm. That's very cool. So nowadays, you, you told me you design processors. You, I imagine you must be part of something that designs processor. It's not like there's a processor, this is the bow processor. You, what do you do? You do one small part of a big processor? <laughs> yes, so, so that's right. So um, I design, um, I say I design processors for a living, but obviously no one actually solves the entire problem. Um, what, what I tend to do is take what has already been designed and, and try to sort of understand how it performs. So I do a lot of what we we'll call benchmarking and analysis to see how the um, the program that runs on that processor can be um, either augmented or how the process, certain parts of the processor, features of the processor can be changed in order to make the program run faster. So um, after the benchmarking and anal analysis, then I make you know suggestions for improvements to some of the other um, architects that I, I, I work with. And uh, we would either, you know, make small sort of incremental improvements, or if it, you know, if it's been a while since the processor that I'm, I'm looking at was designed, then we'll make, you know, a more more sweeping changes and do a, a more sort of radical um, um, change. The the thing that I find really um, fun and enjoyable about the work I do is the opportunities for improvement are endless. Um, so what I mean is there's a tremendous amount of reuse, and I guess you could also call it repurposing in our industry. So as I said, you don't really solve problems in their entirety. Um, you sort of try to do your bit well, and if your solution is modular enough, then someone else can come along, um, improve it, um, transform it, and, and use it to great effect, sometimes even in ways that you, you didn't think of. And, and that's really the most thrilling aspect for me, that the creativity doesn't end with someone like myself, who's um, an architect of these systems, but that someone else will come along and, um, I guess we, I could say we're really just at the uh, at the start of a very long pipeline, and that other people who would um, use the work that we, we we've done, uh, build up on it, and um, and unleash the the world's potential. And that's the that's what what I find really thrilling about what I do. That's cool. So since since you're uh, getting out of academia, you've been always with the same company. Is this correct? Uh, yes. So, so yes. <laughs> since uh, since I, I left Cambridge, I've always I've worked at ARM since then. Yeah. Um, I've I think I'm only I can say I simply say I've only ever worked at ARM. So I did some internships even back when I was a student, and when I um, when, when I finished uh, my postdoc research, I, I joined ARM, and I've been here since. Yeah. Yes. Uh, obviously, people who do the internship don't quite realize it, but the internship is the way of a smart company to get their hands on their uh, smartest students before they decide where to go, where else to go. <laughs> yeah, um, I think internships help and it sort of works both ways, right? You get the company evaluating you and you also have time to sort of evaluate the company before you sort of dive fully in and, and work out if it's the best place for you. So yeah. <laughs> Obviously worked out very well for you. It, it did since um so yes uh, i've been happy here um since i started working in arm i've had some very positive experiences also met some really really bright people um yeah and had the opportunity to to sort of innovate at the at the bleeding edge of the of the industry 
one thing I want to ask you, if you don't mind, is that uh, in Cambridge, uh, unfortunately, the uh, racial balance is not that great. There's not so many uh, black students in the computer science department. There's not so many black students uh, in Trinity. It's not that we don't like admitting them, but not that many apply. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Um... I think the interview we're doing will, will help because I think part of the problem is that maybe some people don't might not feel inspired enough to 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 apply. Um, I'm not entirely sure what the reasons are. I need to see some data <laughs> data so um, before I make any assessments. Um, but but yes, I think in being able to sort of look at look around you and see that you know other people who are somewhat similar to you have been um, able to be successful is plays a huge part. So that's sort of inspiration from when you're um, very young to, um, to sort of look around and say, yeah, I could do that um, and not feel daunted or afraid is it, it, very important. And I, I, and I hope that you know, um, interviews like this and maybe some of the other outreach activities that are happening within Cambridge University and, and also at um, will, will help to, to start to make that change. Let's hope, yes, it's certainly my hope as well. Yeah. Uh, you have clearly been recognized to the highest degree, especially with, you know, after your PhD, you got this um, Title A Fellowship with Trinity, which has an uh, admission rate of maybe less than 1% or something like that. So clearly people have recognized your talents, but I, without knowing for sure, I am quite confident in guessing that there may have also been obstacles by the fact that, you know, uh, because you're black, you're different and stop people treating you. Uh, have you, can you tell us about any, any hiccups that maybe, you know, I had it easier than you in that respect. What, what kind of things happened throughout your academic life? Right, so that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it's a very personal question, um, but I don't have any, I don't have any negative experience. I had, you know, positive experiences and I didn't face any instances of prejudice or, or, or bullying. Um, I think the thing to say is I always knew and at least I always felt reassured that if, um, that, you know, if the, the environment that I was working in was always safe and that if I had faced, you know, such limitations or such um, instances of prejudice, that the institutions I was part of, you know, would have done something about it and would have taken the matter very seriously and done every, everything in their power to, to put things right. Um, the baseline, as you say, is, um, is a poor one. So um, computing currently lacks um, sufficient diversity, which is problematic. Um, I've heard of a number of diversity related initiatives at Cambridge and, um, and also at ARM. We are certainly aware of the need for increased diversity in the industry as a whole and recognize that we all have a part to, to play in, in improving that and in making it a reality. Um, but the thing to remember is increasing diversity is one challenge, um, but many, um, many people are also working hard to improve inclusivity, which I also think is, a, is an equally um, difficult challenge. Um, why I say that is because people look for different things in order to find that crucial sense of belonging. And there is no one size fits all approach to improving inclusivity. So what, what distinction do you make between inclusivity and diversity? Right, so um, improving diversity would be about getting people from all different backgrounds and um, um, sort of different types of people into um, into a certain either in the workplace or into into university, um, but improving inclusivity is the is the next step in which you you make all these you know different people feel like they're part of the institution and that their voices are heard equally. I see. Yes. 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 Very important. Uh, yeah. What would you say has been your experience in Trinity? So you know, in Trinity specifically, um, it has been a very positive experience. I, I made some great friends. <laughs> um, we've all sort of gone off into different parts of the world, so it's, it's been difficult to, to stay in touch. Um, 
but I always felt that I always think I think I had that sense of belonging at, at Trinity. My ideas were valued. Um, the people I interacted with, you know, gave me that sense of confidence that you know I was you know I was you know part of the not just the college, but I was you know a cherished member uh, of the college. Um, and yeah, so, so it was a very positive experience, and I I remember that period fondly. Um, with that sort of academic foundation, I was sort of I had the feeling that you know anything is really possible, and that you know being able to sort of have studied at Cambridge and especially at at, at Trinity College um, helped me open doors that I never thought would be um, would be possible. How, how did you choose Trinity when you applied uh, to a college? Because I still <laughs> to choose something. How did I choose Trinity? Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, back then I didn't know a lot about Cambridge, but I think what, what I remember, one statistic I remember was that Trinity was one of the um, colleges which had already had um, the, basically gave lots of um, bursaries or scholarships to, um, to, to some of their students. And, um, and so back then I was looking for um, a scholarship to study at Cambridge because um, I wouldn't have been able to pay for it or myself or my parents wouldn't have been able to pay for it. And so, um, so yes, I chose Trinity partly because um, uh, I, I, I thought it would be a great place to, to get um, to study, but also perhaps get a scholarship to, to, or, or some sort of studentship to study at Trinity. Right, but you didn't know anyone there. <laughs> so do you think that people uh, I mean let me say I think I think that maybe people who um, don't look like the stereotypical uh, white boy computer nerd uh, may be put off by things that are scary they say well do I really deserve that everybody who gets in there is different from me and so on and so on uh, I as a person who tries to admit just on the basis of your brain, uh, I am uh, disappointed that people um, put their fears forward, which prevents them even from applying before we even get a chance to see, well, actually you're good. So uh, what message can we send to, to those people who are already too scared even to, uh, to put their application in? Because of course, not all of them will get in. 90% will be rejected anyway, whether they're white or black. Uh, but to the ones who could do it, how can we persuade them to overcome their fears? Because it is possible to get in. It is certainly possible to get in. Um, it's, um, I think we, um, they shouldn't be, uh, future applicants shouldn't be afraid to, um, to apply to the Trinity. Um, I think when I got into Trinity, I found the atmosphere very welcoming. And, um, and there is certainly nothing to be afraid of in the sense that even at the interview process, you're made to, to feel at ease and, um, and as you say, it's really down to just, you know, academics. They're not a long list of, you know, factors or other factors, sorry, that you, um, that, or, that you, you use to assess, you know, the people who are applying. So there's no, there are no hidden agendas or at least so I believe. And so there's no, certainly no harm in applying and they shouldn't be afraid to, to put their, their best foot forward because they'll be judged on merit rather than on the um, the color of your skin or some other factors that they're not aware of. Did you meet anyone who was a particular inspiration for you to decide to, I don't know, to go up to Cambridge or, or do other great things that you did? <laughs> um, so back when I was, uh, I was growing up, um, I, to, to be honest with you, I didn't have that many role models who would have, um, who I thought had already studied at Trinity, for instance, and that who would have inspired me to study at Trinity as well. So, um, so yeah, I, I think I had a point where, I, like I said at the very beginning, I had to sort of figure out what I would really like to do, which was to do something um, great for, for society. Um, but I didn't really know what the tools were, and I was just trying to figure out where can I go to learn how to use those tools properly and how to become um, very skilled at, at, you know, at doing things so I could um, understand, say, how computers are put together or how, um, how I can make computers work better. So I can then go on to solve the next um, big, big challenge, which is, like I say, how to, to make um, society better. When I was working in Japan, 
I was the only Westerner in an office of 300 Japanese. Uh, and it feels a bit uh, odd to be the only one of a certain kind. Now, in your, in your situation, in your academic and professional life, uh, did you feel, at least in 21st century, were you treated respectfully by your colleagues? Yes, certainly. I was, I was treated respectfully. Um, I, I can't speak to uh, you know, how a lot of people who look like me who've ended up in computing in, in, this, um, in this century have been, been treated. Um, these statistics, like I said, are, are sort of uh, are not good in the sense that um, computing lacks sufficient diversity. Um, but the, the thing that I, I've always sort of looked at is if you um, if you keep doing your job well, um, that is appreciated. At least in my experience, that that has been appreciated. So um, I I don't get um, hung up with how. Um, uh, um, you know, people might perceive me because I can't. I don't have any control over that. Um, all I can do is is to do a, a good job and to um, and to to show that, like you know, like I've been saying, diversity is a, is, is a good thing, or improving diversity is a, is a good thing, um, not just for um, for the for the company that I work for, or for uh, or you know, back when I was in Cambridge for the university, um, but it's a good thing for society as a whole because we. Um, we would need to have people with different set of views or different perspectives in order to attack some of the, um, the challenging problems that we'll face in the future. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think these are wise words. Um, and that, like you, I'm a foreigner here uh, and uh, I will always be a foreigner, uh, even if I, uh, I don't know, I, I could get second nationality and so on and so on. I would always be a foreigner, uh, but I want to, be considered for what I do, not for where I come from or something like that. Um, that that's right. I, I agree with that. Yeah, you, you have to. Um, you look at people on the um, what they can do and not um, assigned um, labels. Because I feel like sometimes the process of categorization is um, is just something that people do without taking the time to understand people at you know at a, at a deeper level. Um, there's just this constantly growing list of labels that get applied to everyone. And then the quick categorizations that follow that are often lazy. And, and people would you know, sort of use that labeling process to put people in, in, uh, in buckets without realizing that you know, people, humans are in, you know, incredibly complex and also unique at, at the same time. And you know, I know two people would view the same thing in the, in the, in the, in the same way. Um, for me, I, I always think like, you know, similar to what you said, that it's just really enough to be yourself and to do the best you can um, and not try to think, not try to change how you, you, know, you think or sound to conform to any sort of preconceived notions um, about how you should think or act. Um, it's inevitable that, you know, over time, people who spend enough time to get a start sounding similar <laughs> and um but i think that should just be the natural evolution of human behaviors um i don't think it's a requirement that we should all um in, in computer science or even you know in, in any place that we um, we find any job that we find ourselves that we should all expect people to think or act you know in, in, the, in the same way i think diversity is something that should be cherished and um if i come back to my experience at arm the the ethos at arm is that um, great minds don't think alike, certainly, certainly not. Um, and it's important, especially in research, to ensure that we bring people with um, different backgrounds and opinions together to solve problems and challenge some of the traditional ways of doing things, because that is how we, we tackle some, some great challenges in the future. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, you, you will tell me if you, if you agree with what I'm about to say, but there is a kind of complementary side to that, which is that some aspects of human personality, such as you know, liking computers, not everybody likes computers, doesn't matter if you boy or girl. Some people really, really like, really enjoy being able to like me, uh, <laughs> instruct the machine and so on and so on. Uh, and some other people just don't give a damn. Some people are super obsessed about football. Some people just, mm -hmm. 
I am completely uninterested in football, for example, right? <laughs> for example, you, you, you my, haven't watched the World Cup then. I, well, a, a neighbor asked me, ah, oh, what about, you know, I'm Italian and say Italy is in the, in the selection or the final or whatever it is. And I didn't know until he told me yesterday. So I had no idea. That's how uninterested I am in the whole thing. Um, but for example, I am much closer to someone else who is a computer geek who likes uh, staying up late until the program works, uh, regardless of their gender, race, or social status, and so on, than to someone who is an Italian like me, who instead is into, I don't know, football and other stuff that I don't give a damn. So, I don't know yeah. Sense. yeah, I think people are fundamentally uh, <laughs> different, uh, but we're also unique. Um, and we should avoid stereotypes of any sort because our preferences tend to change anyway. Um, so some things that I might have found interesting or, or exciting, you know, you mentioned football, um, maybe um, a year ago or, or you know, or, or two years ago, um, might not be so interesting or, or exciting to me today. So, uh, so those preferences are constantly changing. We're constantly adapting. We're constantly. Um, so sort of changing not just the things we do, but uh, the way we think about the things as well, and and so it, it is. Um, it's never a good idea to you know to look at you know stereotypes or to assign labels to to anyone. Um, we should sort of understand people for who they are, and not assume that just because they like computers, then they'll also have you know certain attributes or certain traits. Because um, you can't infer the other attributes and traits or traits from the fact that they like computers. Um, so yeah, so that's my, my opinion that we shouldn't, um, we should avoid stereotypes of any sort. Yeah. Yes, yes. I guess my experience has been that when I came to Cambridge and I didn't come to Cambridge for university, I came to Cambridge just for work. Uh, and I was working in a place of other computer geeks. And I found them much more similar to me than the people that I had grown up with even though I was the farmer, uh, because they had the same passion as me. Yeah, um, I think that's that's incredible because that's uh, if they have the same passion as you, that's something that you can sort of celebrate together because you, um, you, you might find or enjoy things that might be similar. Um, but like I said, you know, it's something that should be uh, an emergent phenomenon. That's something then something that should be expected or, or promoted or even um, even sort of written down as a requirement. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Yes. So, if we imagine speaking to some young person who's still young enough that they haven't decided what they would do at university. Um, and maybe they think, yeah, I think I, I might enjoy computers, but uh, it's not for me. I'm, not, I'm never gonna get in. What would you say to them? Um, I, I would say they certainly can get in, and they should. Um, they should not be afraid to try. Um, I think computing is very thrilling and, and interesting, and it's a it's a valuable thing to do. Um, I don't imagine what I would, you know, what would I've done if I hadn't, you know, studied computing. I think I enjoy it so much that I can't really imagine how, you know, how my life would be if I, if I hadn't sort of studied it or, or, or started doing it as a, as a, as a profession. Um, is, and I think what they might also wonder is whether it's exciting enough and whether it would sort of hold their interest. Because um, it, it's sort of a, a double-edged sword in the sense that it's incredibly enjoyable but it's also um, incredibly taxing as well. So there's some things that I've, we've, I've had to sort of study or, or some projects I've had to work on that have been incredibly complex. Um, but certainly the excitement and the, the, the fun outweighs you know, the complexity. And, you know, and, the, and not two days are the same in, in the sense that you know, we've only just scratched the surface of what's possible with intelligent machines. And, and in areas like robotics um, in particular, there are lots of opportunities to unleash the, the world's potential. So that's something that's so exciting that um, I can certainly say wholeheartedly, um, just go for it if you're thinking about it, don't, don't be afraid. Um, because we have the potential to create technologies that can 
transform society and build a more sustainable future. So um, it's it's an exciting place to, to be. Right, so um, I, I could probably just add my own sort of personal um, experience at the um, at the forefront of, of, of research and technology. I guess what I would add is that um, that when you sort of get into into it, it really doesn't matter where you're from or what your background is. And um, and what's sort of significant in my case is for someone who didn't really um, play with computers as a child or even you know understand computers uh, when I was growing up. Um, I am now designing some of the most advanced uh, processes in the world. And, um, and I'm really excited because some of the work that I've done have gone on, you know, to start making a real difference. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So many years ago, I worked on something called the scalable vector extension, also known as SVE, um, which was which is an architecture that can improve the way um, computers process information and make them more efficient. So remember what I said about when you get um, computers that when you try to run computers um, at very high speed. You tend to end up, you end up cranking up the amount of energy or power that you, the computer needs. Now, with the scalable vector extension, we're able to push performance, but do so in a very efficient way. And the project was so successful that the um, the architecture now lies at the heart of um, the fastest supercomputer in the world, so a machine called Fugaku, which is at the Riken um, Center for Computational Science in, in Japan. So yeah, so I'm, I'm incredibly um, proud of that achievement because um, from someone who came from uh, uh, you know a very um, an underprivileged background to be able to to sort of design something that then goes on to um, to start solving some of the world's problems because the Fugaku machine is being used you know to to push to advance science and it's also being used in the um, in tackling the the COVID crisis. Um, I think just that sort of process from you know not really knowing a lot to, about computers to being able to make a real impact is something that feels um, incredible to me, and I would encourage other people not to be afraid, but to to try and just to keep trying, and and um, and think that um, anything is possible. Great, <laughs> thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you too. Yeah. <laughs> Great.